I'm, uh, I'm happy to be with you uh, every chance I get. I'd ask if you would, if you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 20. I'm going to go there in, in uh, just a moment. Most of the ver a few of the verses that I'm going to be talking about, I'll have on the screen. But the majority of the text that we're going to study, you know, we're going to read before we get started, is not going to be is not going to be on the on the screen. So if you turn to 1 Kings chapter 20, and I've made a New Year's resolution, and that resolution is to try my best to stand right here, and so I can get on that camera and not walk back and forth. And I'll try my best to stay right here today and not move as much as I as I usually do. Uh, but before we get started, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so blessed, as our dear sister saying, God, you've gave us food to go on our mouths, clothes to go on our backs, ways to, to make ends meet. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful. We're, we don't deserve it, but we know that you take care of us. Heavenly Father, we're going to study a passage today from your word that ensures us that you will take care of those who follow you. Pray, dear God, that we can all take this lesson today. We can make application of it into our lives. We may be able to even teach someone that Jesus is the only way. He's the way to eternal life through obedience to His Word. Heavenly Father, it's, it's my prayer this morning that for someone here who has yet to submit to Your message to obey Your Gospel, that today would be the day that they would do that. They would walk this aisle, would, would confess their sins and, and become a, a baptized believer in Your Son. Watch over us and guide us. Be with the this speaker. Uh, forgive his sins, which are many. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. First Kings chapter twenty tells a pretty interesting story. Uh, you may have read it, probably have read it, but it's an interesting story. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to touch on it. I, I'm going to get the the first part of the story, but there's a little more to the story. If you ever get a time uh, or a make time. Read First Kings chapter twenty. It's an interesting story. But before we even get started with the story, I want to make sure we understand there's two main characters in this story. There's King Ahab. You've heard of King Ahab. He was the seventh king of the divided kingdom of Israel. Remember, God punished. His, his children. He had the kingdom divided into Judah in the south and Israel in the north. And, 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 and Ahab was the seventh king of this divided kingdom of Israel. The time frame of this story is about a hundred years after the reign of King David. So you know, kind of put it in perspective. hundred years after the reign of, of King David. King Ahab was a, was a wicked king. He was a Baal worshiper. As a matter of fact, every king of Israel, after it was divided, was a wicked king, and all but just a couple of those in the south, in Judah, were wicked kings. But Ahab was a wicked king. He was a Baal worshiper. He was married to a lady we're familiar with, a lady by the name of Jezebel. When you hear the word Jezebel, what, does, what do you think about? Wicked and evil. Ahab was married to Jezebel. Jezebel apparently ran the show. Ahab, in history books, you'll read about King Ahab, that he's, he's known as one who tried to make peace. That's not true. He was kind of a weak one. He was submissive. So King Ahab was a wicked king. Then there's the other king we're going to study about today, a king by the name of Ben-Hadad. He was the king of Aram which is known as, as Syria. As a matter of fact, some translations say Syria, some say Aram, but it's, it's modern-day Syria. Same location, same place. King Benedict. 
was the king of Syria. He was a pagan king, a very wicked king, but he was a powerful military leader. As a matter of fact, 32 other countries had, he, he kind of controlled them in their military. So whenever King Abinadad wanted to go in and attack another country, he had 32 other countries with him. Most of the known world at the time was with King Benadad. He was very, very powerful. So we've got these two kings, King Ahab of Israel and King Benadad of Syria. Now 1 Kings chapter 20 tells an interesting story, but the underlying <laughs> message of the whole story is this. God always takes care of His people regardless of their circumstances. And I'm going to say that again because you're going to hear that several times today. God always takes care of His people. And I'm going to stop right there. Amen? Amen? Although there's many ways this sermon can go, I'm going to focus on one particular part of this story in 1 Kings chapter 20. But here's the story. In 1 Kings chapter 20, Benadad of Syria, he decides he's going to attack Israel. Because he likes to go, he likes to fight. As Aaron Davis would say, man, he's a tough dude. He likes to fight. So he decides he's going to go in and attack Israel. He's got 32 kings and, and their armies backing him up. So he's going to come and fight Israel. He sends a message to King Ahab which says this. He says, your silver and your gold are mine. And your loveliest wives and your children are mine. In other words, buddy, I'm coming. I'm, and I'm coming to get them. Your gold and your silver, they're mine. So King Ahab gets this, this message from Benadad. And Ahab, apparently a little bit jelly-backed, he responds this way. Ahab says, and the king of Israel, Ahab answered. And he said, my Lord, O king, just as you say, all I have, or I and all I have are yours. In other words, ben and Dad, or, uh, the king Ahab was saying, come on. Just, just come on in. You can have it. And you know how a bully is. If you give a bully an inch, he'll take a mile. So ben and Dad, that wasn't enough for him. When the messengers came back and told King Benadad that uh, King Ahab was going to, you know, he, you know he's fine. He said, come on down. You know, he's okay. That wasn't enough for Benadad. Because he sent messengers back and said this. Thus speaks Benadad, saying, Indeed, I have sent to you, saying, You shall deliver to me your silver, your gold, your wives, and your children. But, I will send my servants to you tomorrow about this time. And they will search your house and your houses of your servants. And it shall be that whatever is pleasant in your eyes, they will put in their hands and take it. In other words, not only are we coming in to fight you, we're going to come into your home. We're going to take everything that's precious and dear to you, Ahab. You know, defeating you is not enough. Everything you hold dear, Ahab, I'm coming to get. Ahab realizes he's, he's in trouble. And he calls the uh, leaders of, of Israel together. The elders of, of, of Israel together. And they advise him. They say, you probably shouldn't give in, Ahab. You probably shouldn't just let him come and do that. So Ahab sends back word to Benedict. But he says, your last demand, he actually grows a little bit of spine. He says, that last demand that you sent, I, I just, I can't, I can't stand for that. We can't do that. So Benadad becomes angry. He says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, I'm sending them down there. We're going to war. And when I finish with you, my soldiers won't, in, won't even be able to pick up a handful of dust that's left in your country. I'm going to wipe the whole thing out. But you know, a long story short, they're getting ready to fight. And, and God sends a prophet to Ahab. 
this wicked king Ahab. And he tells him that God will allow Israel, lowly little Israel, to defeat Abinadad's mighty forces. And why? I think 1 Kings 20 and 13 tells us the answer why. So suddenly a prophet approached Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus says the Lord, have you seen all this great multitude? In other words, look at that army. There's 32, there's 33 of them actually together. That's a mighty army. Have you seen the great multitude? But behold, I will deliver it into your hand today. Why? And you shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, he's saying, Ahab, hey, they're coming to get you. And you're a lonely army. You're a weak army. But, but I'm going to deliver them into your hands because I'm going to show you that I am I'm God. And we know that with, with God's help, 7,000 Israelites defeat the great multitude, hundreds of thousands, of the Syrian army in the mountains of Israel in that first battle. God keeps His promise. But King Benadad escapes. Now let's go to the, the passage for the sermon today. 1 Kings 20, 22 through 29. I'll be reading verses 22 through 29 of 1 Kings 20. So they've had a, a battle. God has delivered Israel from King Benadad and his forces the first time. But listen to what it says in verse 22 of, of 1 Kings. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said, the prophet comes back again. And he says to him, go strengthen yourself. Take note and see what you should do. For in the spring of the year, the king of Syria, Benadad, the king of Syria will come up against you. In other words, he's coming back again. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Then the servants of the king of Syria said to him, so, so Benadad's servants said this, their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we, but if we fight against them in the plain, surely we'll be stronger than they. So do this thing. Dismiss the kings each from his position and put captains in their places. And you shall muster an army like the army that you've lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. Then we will fight against them in the plain. Surely we'll be stronger than them this time. And he listened to their voice, and he did so. So it was in the spring of the year that Benadad mustered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were mustered and gave provisions, and they went against them. Now the children of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of goats while the Syrians filled the countryside. So second battle, it says the Israelites looked like just a small herd of goats. But here was Syria again, filled the whole countryside, the whole army. And then a man of God came and spoke to the king of Israel, third time, and said, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is God of the hills, but He's not God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand. Why? And you shall know that I am Lord. He says it again. And they encamped opposite each other for seven days. So it was on the seventh day that the battle was joined. And listen to this. And the children of Israel killed 100,000 foot soldiers of the Syrians in one in one day. Beat them again. I want to move on and get with the lesson. Because in Benadad, I think we see, my friends, we see a picture of our adversary, the devil. I think if you think about it, you'll see that we know that God allows us to win our daily victories against the devil. Amen? 
But we also know that the devil is going to return to fight another day. See, his desire, Satan's desire, my friends, is to see you defeated. And he's going to change his tactics when he comes to fight another day, the first time, no worry. He's going to get you one way or another. Remember what 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says? That the devil goes around like a what? A roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. You see, the Syrians led by Abinadab thought wrongly that maybe if we get them in a different place, maybe if we get them off the mountains and get them down here in the valleys, we can beat them. Let's change our tactics. That's exactly what Satan does with us. He, he tries to get us by changing his tactics. And what I want to do this morning quickly is I want to look at three simple points from the passage that we read explaining how God always, always takes care of His people. First of all, let's look that there was a dangerous assumption. From what we read, 1 Kings 20 23 said this. Then the servants of the king of Syria said to him, Now this is Abinadad's servants, they say. If they beat us the first time, their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than us. But if we fight against them in the plain, surely we'll be stronger than they. In other words, their God, he's just a God of the hills. That's you know, let's fight them again. Let's get them down here in the valley and we know and we know that we can beat them then because you know, their God won't be with them in, in the valley. See, the Syrians make a dangerous assumption. You see, they thought that God was the God of the hills and not the God of the valleys. Surely they could defeat the Israelites if they just get them down in the plains. And here's the lesson. We know this. The God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Amen. Amen. It's the same God. Our God, the God of the valley, of the mountain, is the God of the valley. Amen. Now don't that excite you? Let me say, it's impossible for Satan to defeat an excited Christian. You know that? It's impossible. You know, when we're on that mountain spiritually, Man, we're a force to be reckoned with. But because of, of human nature, because of the world we live in and the things we are, we don't always stay on that mountain, do we? Sometimes we sink down in those, in those valleys. Let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you've never had a tough time in your life. That's what I thought. So nobody lives on that mountain the whole time. Sometimes we get down in those valleys. We go through tough times in our lives. And you know this, that's when Satan works his hardest. See, when we're on that mountain and we're excited, we're a force to be reckoned with. But when we drop down in those valleys and things in our lives seem to be going wrong, that's when Satan, that's when Satan works his hardest. You see, the scenario was perfect for Ben and Dad. Let's get them off the mountain. Let's find them again down here in this valley. And that's when we can, that's when we can defeat them. But what we need to remember is this. We need to remember to cling to God in those valleys. Just as hard as we praise Him when we're on the mountain. There's a story that goes like this. The devil decided one day he was going to have a yard sale. He was going to sell all of his tools. So he got him some tables and he, and he put his tables out and he laid all of his tools out for sale. You know, he had the tool of, 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 of envy. He had the tool of, of jealousy, the tool of hatred, the tool of lying, and all these other tools he had laid out for sale with a real cheap sale price. But over on a table by itself was a little small worn out tool that had a real, real high price tag on it. And that tool was called discouragement. And somebody asked Satan, said, why do you have all these other tools priced so cheap, but this one little tool of discouragement, 
Why is it priced, it priced so high? And here's what the devil said. It's my most useful tool. Because with it, I can pry open a person's heart. And once I get inside their heart, I can use the other tools to make him do whatever I choose. See, discouragement is a dangerous thing. It's been said that discouragement is the handle that works all of Satan's tools. See, he knows we're hard to get when we're on that mountain. But if he gets us at the right time, when we're in one of those valleys, he thinks he can do with us what he wants to. And sadly, he, you know, that's, he, you know, he's been right in many cases. You see, if he gets you to focus, if Satan gets you to focus on the negatives in your life, how many's got some negatives in their life? All of us. If he gets you to focus on those things, if he gets you to take your eyes off Jesus, he's going to get you discouraged. And you're going to be easy, easy to defeat. I've heard this said before, and you have too, and I believe it. Life is 10% is, is of what happens to you and 90% of how you react to it. I believe that. Life is 10% of what happens. But 90% how you react. In other words, your attitude is the most important thing in dealing with any situation. And if we develop a woe is me attitude, poor old pitiful me attitude, we become easy prey for Satan. You see, we should learn to put into practice the lessons we find in Philippians 4 beginning in verse 6 as we seek God's guidance. Paul told the Philippians, he said, be anxious for nothing. Now, did he say don't worry? Not really. Being anxious is, is there are two different words. Anxious and worry are two different words. In the Greek, worry is, is, is worry. But anxious is when you let it control you. So, Paul understands, Jesus understands, God understands. You know, Paul even said, I have a deep concern. I, I worry about the churches. So Paul had worry in his life. We know that we're going to have worry, but Paul, Paul says be anxious for nothing. Don't let it control you. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. When you're off that mountain, when you're in those valleys, you reach up to God through prayer. And don't worry about it. Let your request be made known to Him. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, I love that. Will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. You see, Christians, we should never assume no matter where we're at in our lives, mountain or valley, we should never assume that the God of heaven is not with us in whatever circumstance. You see, the Syrians thought they could get the Israelites in the valley. And they made a bad assumption. And then we read on, there was a dynamic announcement. 1 Kings 20, 28. Abinadad thinks he's going to get them in the valley, so they're getting ready to go to war again. And then this, you know, this prophet, this man of God, comes to King Ahab again and says, spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is the God of the hills, and He's not the God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know I am the Lord. See, there's only one problem with the Syrians' assumption. The creator of the universe never leaves his people. Even though they had sinned, they had sinned to the point to where God had them split, and they were being led by a Baal-worshipping, somewhat jelly-backed king named Ahab. These were the, the people, the descendants of the people he had delivered, and he wasn't going to leave them. That shows us the value, I think, of one soul to God. You know, if you're sitting here this morning, my friends, I want you to know that God wants nothing more than to have you with him one day in heaven. Now, that's the good news. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And God's intent was to show Ahab that Jehovah, the Jehovah God, the one and only God, was the one true God. And I want to remind you again this morning that God is bigger than your vow. Amen. Amen? Amen? God's bigger than your vow. It doesn't matter what your vow is. See, it's easy to get excited when we're on top of that mountain. But I want you to remember this. In the valley of loss, God's still God. In the valley of physical pain, God is still God. In the valley of addiction, God is still God. In the valley of physical or verbal abuse, God is still God. In the valley of sorrow, in the valley of sadness, in the valley of loss and everything else, God is still God. And if you trust in Him, if you trust in His promises, He will never, ever leave you. Amen. I've said this before, and, and this, is, this has become my favorite verse lately. Exodus 14, 14. When God was talking to Moses and the Israelites, He said, the Lord will never leave you. Or, or the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Isn't it wonderful to know that the Creator of the world, the God of heaven, will fight for us if we serve Him? The Bible is, is full of verse after verse after verse. Old Testament and New Testament. Verse after verse that reminds us that God is in control. And just one example, Paul told the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ. How often does He do it? Sometimes. He always leads us to triumph in Christ. The God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Paul says, as, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. You see, just like the Syrian army thought, Satan tries to get us at a point and overwhelm us. But we need to make sure we stand firm in his promises. A promise that he will never, ever leave you. See, my friends, our battle is not won on this earth. The ultimate battle is not. The ultimate battle is not of this world. It's in, it's in heaven, the ultimate place. The ultimate throne. Amen. In Romans chapter 8, Brother Jake, I read this this morning. But Paul reminds us again. He says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded, I love this. For I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But you know what? You say, preacher, I've got some problems. You don't know what kind of problems I've got. Now, we're not foolish. We know that we have problems on this earth. We know that sometimes our problems may be so great that we may even wonder why we have to go through these things. Let me assure you of one thing this morning. I can't tell you about your problems, but I can tell you one thing. We're on the winning side if you're on Christ's side. Do you believe that this morning? We're on the winning side. Just remember this. The battle may be raging around me, but it don't have to rage within me. We sang a song this morning. I asked, I asked Brother Tom to sing it. It's called Tell Me the Story of Jesus. It and many other songs you'll find in your song book was written by a lady by the name of Fanny Crosby. She died you know, a couple hundred years ago, but, but, but she wrote many songs. Fanny Crosby was blind from birth. 
but yet she wrote many songs we sang in the church they blessed assurance Jesus is mine Fanny Crossman wrote that tell me the story of Jesus but she wrote this poem she born blind she penned this poem when she was eight years old oh what a happy soul am I she was eight years old by the way it's like I said that although I cannot see I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind. I cannot. And I won't. Isn't that beautiful? She had a good attitude, didn't she? See, God announced to wicked King Ahab. To wicked King Ahab. He announced that I'm going to deliver you, Israel, from this Syrian army, again. And I'm going to show you that God is in charge. And I'm going to show you that God's going to take care of those. Because you know what? I guarantee you, some of those people in Israel believed in God. There's, there may have even been one person in Israel <coughs> excuse me, who believed in God. But God was going to take care of those who, who believed in Him. And He announces all throughout His world his word. That he's going to protect those who love him. So guess what? The second battle's on. They're fighting again. Abinadad has got his forces back. He's trying to get them down in the plain. And, and he's going to fight them the second time. And the second battle's on. Then there was a divine accomplishment. The last point. 1 Kings 20 29 says this. And they encamped, speaking of the army of Israel, the lowly army of Israel. And they encamped opposite each other for seven days. And so it was on the seventh day the battle was joined. In other words, they got into it. Syria and Israel on the seventh day. And the children of Israel killed 100,000 foot soldiers. Of the Syrians in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city. Then a wall fell on 27,000 of the men who were left. And Benadad fled and went into the city into an inner chamber. 127,000 Syrian soldiers were killed. And the people of Israel believed God. Or Benadad believed in God's messenger at least. I'm sorry, Ahab believed in God's messenger at least. And they enjoyed a tremendous victory over the Syrian army. You see, my friends, that is the point that God desires that we reach in our lives. A point in which we, we fully believe that no matter how big our challenge is, and, and no matter how big our troubles are, no matter how mighty the opponent is, we're on the winning side. Here's what God wants from us. You, he wants us to get our eyes off of our troubles off of our cares, off of all the things we have going on on a daily basis in our lives. He wants to take our eyes off of them and focus our eyes on the line of Judah, Jesus Christ. So I like what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us because we get in those valleys. And that sin sometimes can get a hold of us. He says, let us lay aside and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto who? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, I think too many times, listen to this, I think too many times we live like we're Christian atheists. One of the best books I ever read. It's called Christian Atheist. You know what that means? We say we believe in God, but we live our lives like we don't. Are we guilty sometimes of being Christian atheists? Saying we believe in God, 
But yet the first time something happens or the first chance we get, we're going to do what we can to show the whole world, everybody around us, that we don't believe in it. Sometimes we can be Christian atheists. Believing in God, but living like we don't believe it. There's a flight filled with passengers. A plane. You open the air traveling from one destination to the other. And this plane experiences some very strong turbulence. Real strong turbulence. And to the point of where they were getting scared. The plane was shaking and everything was going on. And people were starting to panic. There's one little boy up towards the front of the plane. He's playing with his little car in the seat. I mean, you didn't care about that turbulence. And they asked him, they said, look, why are you not concerned? You know, just feel what's going on around us. And that little boy looked up at him and said this, and I love this. He looked at him so calm, and he said, because my daddy's the one flying this plane. <laughs> now think about that for a minute. Christians, we should look at life like that. Mm. Our fathers are one at the wheel. God's flying the plane. Amen. Amen. And we're going to experience some turbulence. We're going to have some things that, you know, that bounce us around in life. But God is at the wheel. Amen. He's in control. God fights for us. What about Joshua and Caleb? They sent Joshua and Caleb off into the promised land to look and see. And ten spies come back and say, oh, there are giants there. We can't go. What did Joshua and Caleb say? Let's go. God's witness. Who was in charge? God. You want about King David? Came face to face with a giant, a nine foot tall giant. All he had was no armor and a couple stones in the sling. Big Goliath. Who was with David? God. The same God that's with us today. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Thrown into a fire for not worshiping a false God. But yet they came out unscathed. Who was with them? God. Fill in the blank with your problem. Whatever problem you may have, fill in the blank. But, but answer it this way. God's with you. He's in control. He's driving the plane. He's driving the car. I can do all things through Christ, Paul said, who gives me, who gives me strength. You know, there's more to the story. From First Queen, First Kings twenty, but I'm gonna let you read the rest. Ahab promised a, a punishment because Abinadab lives through the second fight, and and then Ahab goes and tries to make a treaty with him. Makes a treaty with him, and they become big buddies. And, you know, and God says you're gonna be punished because you did that. That's how kind of how the story ends. But I don't know what you're facing today. You know, maybe the devil is using his tool of discouragement in, in your life. And you may feel like you're a million miles from the mountaintop. <clears throat> Let me remind you of three things, three sentences, as I close and we'll sing our song. Number one, the God of the mountain. He is the God of the valley. And number two, God always takes care of his people. And number three, most importantly today, if you're outside of Christ, God loves you. And He wants you to call, or He wants to call you His own. <coughs> Perhaps you're, you're here today. And maybe you're tired of living the way you're living. Maybe you're tired of living a life. Maybe you're tired of not doing what you know you need to do. Maybe today will be the day that you will decide that you're going to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and know without a doubt, I believe it with every soul of my being, that Jesus Christ, who died for you, His blood was shed for you, those who obey His gospel, God will take care of. Amen. I believe it to the bottom of my heart.
If you're here this morning and you're outside of Christ, why not start this new year? Just a few days into it. Why not start this new year all fresh? Everybody makes resolutions that we usually keep for a couple weeks. But why not keep one for life? Why not obey the gospel? Why not come this morning and confess your sins? Repeat that Jesus Christ is, is the Son of God. The Bible says you can be immersed in water for the remission of your sins and you can be raised to walk in newness of life. Man, that's a good deal. And every little problem that you have, every little thing that you have, know that you're not the one driving anymore. Our Father is driving for you. We're going to stand at this time and we're going to sing. If there's anything at all that can be done for you this morning, I would ask that you come.